So today on Financial Markets Microstructure we will be looking at the issues of market transparency. And as usual let us um, first start with a quick review of what happened last week. Last week we were talking about market fragmentation, about what happens if the same asset is traded on more than one market, and we saw that this kind of situation may have its costs and benefits. So you would have uh, probably more adverse selection due to weaker competition of the insiders, of the informed traders. And it might uh, also instrumentally lead to less risk, uh, less risk sharing, although that was a slightly less convincing argument. But surprisingly, there were also some benefits to fragmentation, to having many platforms. Firstly, in our kind of world, all of these markets have relatively clearly established ownership, which means that um, they can react to the environment. So these platforms are also strategic economic agents. And if there are many of them, they would compete with each other, which would lead to lower order processing costs for the traders, which is a good thing for the traders for the welfare because uh, lower transaction costs lead to greater efficiency in the market. And, oh, sorry. Uh, and um, we also saw in a couple of different ways that fragmentation may lead to greater aggregate depth in the market. Or to be more precise, uh, we saw one way in which greater depth can uh, establish in the market. And I asked you to look at another way at home. So we looked at dealer markets and I asked you to also look at uh, limit order markets. So that was last week. And today we will look, move to a somewhat related topic, which is market transparency. If you think about transparency in financial markets and in markets in general, you would think that financial markets are actually one of the more transparent ones that are out there because uh, you can quite often access all that historical price and trade data sometimes it costs some money sometimes it comes at a delay of 15 minutes or more which is hilariously little compared to most other markets so you would think that financial markets actually provide a huge amount of information compared to most other markets. But on the other hand, uh, it is also true that some things that you are used to in regular markets are just not available in financial markets. So you would, plain, plain and simple, you might not even know the price at which you will trade, at which your order will be executed. So that's if you submit a market order. And if, if you submit a limit order, you will just have no, will have no guarantee that your uh, order will be executed at all, that you will get to trade. So transparency is um, both greater and uh, lesser than in regular markets. And we will see how this transparency affects market outcomes. So there are also a lot of dimensions in which financial, financial markets can be heterogeneous in terms of transparency. So some markets can make uh, some things observable, other markets can make uh, other things observable or accessible. And we will see how that works. And we'll also in particular look at different kinds of transparency. So what kind of data is relevant to the market? And uh, we'll see that different kinds of information might have different effects on the market you know not too surprising and this continues nicely our discussion from last week where uh, questions have already arisen such as if market is fragmented if you have two platforms that trade in the same asset can they communicate with each other can they observe prices from one another can they observe orders from one another so that's exactly the kind of questions that we will be looking at today. And um, symmetrically, it also gives us the first implication of market transparency. 
So it uh, already tells us that transparency might negate the issues of fragmentation, right? Because if participants of all markets observe exactly the same kind of information and they can direct their trades to any market, then uh, all effects of fragmentation are basically negated. So that's, that was a very quick uh, intro. And now for a second part of the intro. So when we're talking about different kinds of transparency, what kind of information can we uh, talk about? What kind of information can be accessible to the traders? Well, the three categories that the textbook identifies and that are quite reasonable are as follows. On the one hand, you have pre-trade information. So the kind of information that you may or may not uh, get to see before you submit uh, your order to the market. So you may or may not see the quotes that are already on the market. You might or might not see the whole limit order book. And these, of course, would uh, determine, would affect your decision on which order to submit. Uh, secondly, during the trade itself, you may or may not get to observe who you're trading with. And that, you can already guess what the implications are. That is kind of the thing that we've been talking about this whole class. Uh, if, you are, if you see that you are trading against a person who is likely to be informed or uninformed, then you would behave very, very differently. So we'll talk about this closer to the end of today's lecture. And the third kind of information that you may or may not have is post-trade of information. So does exchange release any kind of information after trades have occurred? Or equivalently, does the exchange provide you with access to historical data on past trades and prices? We will see that this also has quite different implications. Now, exchanges themselves um, obviously have access to almost all of this information that we just mentioned. So it is their decision on whether they want to release it or not. And the exchanges typically profit from selling this type of data. So this is one of the main sources of their income, I guess, alongside uh, participation fees, membership fees, order processing fees, so this kind of uh, direct costs of trading. And so when exchanges trade in this information, they, on the one hand, they want to, uh, of course, set a reasonable price, so make this data somewhat accessible, so someone would buy it. Uh, so they are not benefiting from making this data completely inaccessible. But on the other hand, they don't want to give it away for free, obviously, either. And uh, they also realize that by releasing their own data, they probably help competing uh, exchanges. For example, exchange A does not want exchange B to profit from the price discovery that's happening in exchange A. So this would be one of the incentives to make this data slightly less accessible, to make higher price um, than without such kind of externality. And so you... Uh, you can guess that uh, in equilibrium there will be some intermediate level of transparency in the market. And what this can lead to is that different traders will end up with different pieces of information. So some traders will decide to buy this information, some traders will decide to not buy this information. So you'll have asymmetric information in your market, in your society, and uh, that's never a good thing. If there's one thing we'll learn in economics, is that asymmetric information can lead to all kinds of frictions. And this course is one illustration of that. And secondly, as we will see, uh, some traders may also benefit from a lack of transparency. So you would guess that traders in general would like to have uh, more information. So the more information available, the better for the traders, but we'll see that this is not quite the case. 
So transparency is subject to a lot of regulation. There are a lot of laws in place to regulate what kind of information traders and exchanges must disclose. So in both Europe and the US there are some rules to ensure that enough information is released pre-trade so that quotes are accessible, limit order book is accessible enough, although that's probably less regulated. Uh, yeah, firms must also disclose relevant information to decrease informed trading, so that earnings reports are designed to uh, make uh, to make the information available to insiders also available to all other traders in the in the market. So these earnings reports are designed to decrease the degree of asymmetry of information in the market between the informed and the less informed traders. No, I sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Um, yeah, one of the ways in which this regulation manifests, at least in the US, is uh, they have a centralized system for collecting post-trade information. This NMS, National um, Marketplace System? I am not even sure. But the idea is they have this one centralized system which collects information about all trades that have happened in uh, financial assets. So it was primarily I think it was first adopted in equity. It was more recently extended to bond markets, I believe. And uh, it may or may not apply to derivatives. Okay, so in general, we will see a lot of consequences of uh, transparency. And before we start our exploration, I want to give you a... Whoa, I did not expect that to happen. Uh, I want to give you a quick story. Um, just a fable from the real world. So there is this popular music performer Jay-Z and uh, a few years ago, uh, two years ago is probably not accurate, it was more than this by now. I have not updated th this. So Jay-Z bought a music service Aspire. I don't really know what service this is, but maybe some of you know it. So, and Aspire was listed on Swedish stock exchange. So that's Jay-Z, for those of you who don't know him. And shortly after this um, acquisition of a lot of stocks, Aspire launched a new service called Tidal. And it was very warmly received by investors, so Aspire's stock price uh, really started climbing up. Thing is, Jay-Z has really bought a lot of stocks of Aspire. In particular, he bought more than 90% of the stock. And uh, many countries, Sweden included, say that um, have this regulation in place, which says that once you accumulate this critical mass of stocks, 90%, 95% maybe, but some super majority of stocks, other traders may be forced to sell their stock to you so that um, the new owner can consolidate ownership and uh, maybe delist sorry the firm from the exchange and in particular in sweden this regulation worked in such a way that uh, the price at which these uh, this buyback uh, this transaction will have to occur was fixed at some level so it might have been the average price. Oh, yeah, sorry. It should have been the same price at which Jay-Z bought uh, the first stock. So this price was fixed. Which meant that... Sorry, it meant nothing. The chronology of events was such that when this trade was supposed to be executed. This stock price started climbing up to incredible heights that it has never seen before. And trading halted when the stock price was at 11 kroner per share, when the buyback was supposed to happen at uh, one and something kroner per share. 
So some traders were buying stocks at 11 kroner that they were then forced, would have been forced to sell at 1 kroner. This is really, really irrational behavior. So either all of these traders were really excited about Tidal, that new service, and they did not know that Jay-Z will buy the stock back, or they knew that Jay-Z will have to buy back the stock, but they did not know that the price of this transaction was fixed, and maybe they thought that uh, the buyback will have to happen at the market price. So they thought that they would buy at 11, but the price will climb even further, so Jay-Z will have to buy uh, the stocks back at this higher price. So in, in particular, the graphs look like that. Uh, the trading opened that day. At, so this green line is about 105. It's the buyback price. The trading opened at that price. And this is how the stock price went soon after. So this high point is about 11 kroner. So trading was just stopped. The exchange said, you know what? All of you guys are stupid. You should not do that. Uh, so the exchange called all the brokers, informed them on what is happening so that they would maybe transmit that information to their client. So this happened across some time. Then the trading was resumed and the price was adjusted back down to or close to what, where it was before. The trading opened again. And the price started climbing back up immediately. So even this educational work did not help. And then the trade was just shut down immediately. Exchange said, you know what, if you're not, if you do not understand, our regulation will just not allow you to uh, trade at all. So the moral of the story uh, is that Transparency does not just mean that information must be available somewhere in some shape or form. Because in this story, the information uh, the, about the regulation according to which Jay-Z would be uh, forced to buy back the stock. This regulation is publicly accessible. It is in the laws, right? But traders are just not accessing this. The... Maybe their information acquisition cost is too high. So information must not only be accessible, it must be cheap, it must be in readily digestible form, it must be readily available. So this is kind of way in which we will look at uh, transparency. So yeah, the bottom line is sometimes even the most basic and readily available information can be opaque to some traders. So this was the story. Let us go back to... Uh, the thing. So we'll look at three kinds of transparency, three kinds of information in sequence. And we'll start with looking at pre-trade transparency. So quote uh, and uh, limitary book availability. In some markets, well, uh, yeah, we'll just start with quote transparency. Whether you can or cannot observe the price at which you will trade immediately. In some markets, uh, quotes are readily available, right? You can see the whole limit or a book, or the dealers are posting their quotes online. So you may pay a cost to access this information, like membership fee for the exchange, but this information is somewhat readily available. In other, however, markets, in markets for uh, very illiquid assets, in OTC markets, you do not get to see the price immediately. So you must actively contact dealers and ask what is the price at which they would be willing to trade uh, to buy or sell this particular stock or bond or derivative. So the dealers do not publish these quotes, but you must solicit these quotes from them. Or maybe, alternatively, there are some quotes available in the market, but uh, you still have to contact dealers if you want to get a price improvement. You're expected to get a price improvement. 
And in that case, you'll still have to contact uh, dealers one by one to see what kind of uh, prices they have. They actually, they are actually willing to offer to you as opposed to the ones they quoted to the market. And um, this leads to a very famous, let's say, paradox. Yeah, uh, It's called Diamond's Chain Store Paradox. And you might have uh, already seen it in some of the other classes, like if you've taken the industrial organization. And this paradox goes as follows. So imagine a product market. We'll just stick with Diamond's original formulation. So you have uh, consumers who are willing to buy some product and firms that are willing to sell some product. But um, imagine there is a trading street or a mall strip and the stores are just located one by one. There is no internet, so you cannot look up the prices in all of these stores uh, immediately. So firms' prices are not initially seen by consumers. But consumers are searching these stores sequentially. So I walk into one, I see what their price is. I either buy it and leave the street or I walk out and go into the next store and see what their price is. And the main assumption is that there is some search cost C for just walking into every next store. So searching is costly. And then let us look for an equilibrium in which all stores act uh, symmetrically. So it's not the case that some stores are always the first, some stores are always second. Let's just say all consumers approach stores in random order, so all firms are in a sense equivalent. In this case it would be reasonable that all stores would set the same price in the market. And the key observation here is that every store has a market power. So if, I, if, if a consumer expects that the next store will charge price P, then today I can charge this consumer who just walked in up to P plus C if I want. Because the consumer will want to pay P plus, say, C, papalam, uh, C over 2, sorry, uh, up to P plus C over 2 instead of uh, just searching another store in current cost C and getting price P there. So every store has market power, right? And uh, an equilibrium in which all stores charge the same price P will only be feasible if this is the monopoly price. If this is the price that the firm would set without any competition because it always has the freedom to increase the price a little bit. So the price must be such in equilibrium that the firm is not willing to increase it further. So that is the chain store paradox for you. And in financial markets, the story is exactly the same. Just substitute firms with dealers and consumers with traders and traders are searching for quotes across dealers. <clears throat> And you will see that, uh, that the same logic applies. The dealers will no longer be competitive. They will actually charge the profit maximizing uh, bid and ask quotes. And so the spread will be pretty wide. The source of this effect is that the undercutting, which underlies this kind of competitive interaction that we have had in the back of our minds before, is no longer working in this context. So it doesn't pay to be the cheapest dealer. If I set the price slightly lower than everyone else in the market, then it will not give me all of the business of all the traders. Because traders will not know that I set this lower price. Because I cannot just announce it. But consumers rather have to approach me to get this price. And this, of course, breaks down if I actually can advertise the price. So if the dealers can post the quotes, then this uh, logic will probably break down. But the fun part about the model is that it does not, this conclusion, 
that prices are at the monopoly level, this conclusion does not actually depend on the size of the surge cost. So even if there, there is just, if the C is infinitesimally small, you will still get this monopoly pricing. And the textbook says otherwise, but they are cheating pretty blatantly, so I don't want you to listen to them. And in this model, even if C is exactly zero, you will still have an equilibrium in which monopoly pricing ensues. So this, I would perfectly agree that this is probably an artifact of this particular model. And in real world, these frictions are probably increasing in search costs. So with small search costs, there is some market power, there might be a discontinuity at zero. And uh, this, the amount of market power that the dealers have increases in the search cost of the traders. And you can think of some fancier models that do actually capture this. So what are the welfare implications of this search cost model? Here dealers will have higher uh, profits because they have market power. So dealers will be really happy if the market was not transparent, if quotes were not available. So they would be willing to commit to inability of uh, giving a public quote. So they would like to not be able to advertise the price. Right? All the traders, on the other hand, are really worse off because they are uh, facing these large search costs. They are suffering from the wider spreads. And the less sophisticated traders, which here uh, we use in terms of having higher search costs. So if I'm very uh, newbie, inexperienced retail trader, I don't really know where to search for quotes, right? Whom should I call? Who are the dealers whom I should call? As opposed to a uh, large institutional investor, they are probably already having a lot of uh, established connections to the dealers, so they have them on quick dial. So it's less costly for them to search for quotes. So in this model, the less sophisticated traders suffer more. On the other hand, the, the situation in which no quotes are available is relatively rare in modern markets. So I think probably the conclusions that we just got, that all traders are worse off, and we can also say that the efficiency of the market will be lower due to transaction costs. This led all regulators to say that, well, you know, this this kind of transparency we definitely want to enforce because dealers, mar uh, sorry, market makers and exchanges will not be willing to do it on their own. We got to regulate them. We got to force them to provide this kind of efficiency. We got to force them to publish the quotes. And in the end, the best bid and ask price are quite often observable. So if you look at quotes from any given exchange, if you remember back in the first lecture when I did I no so um, yeah I think I did not give you the maybe I did I can't remember even yeah I think I did gi give you a card of a stock from the exchange it's a stock price best bid best ask and so on so it only showed the best bid and ask in the U S you even have this national best bid and uh, offer. So you can always readily observe, not only observe, but automatically trade at the best price available at the market at, at any given moment. But the twist is that even though you get to see the price at which you will trade the first few units of the asset, depth is really difficult to gauge. So you get to see the best quotes, but not how these quotes change with uh, order size. So you do not get to know how deep is the market, how much will the price change when your order size changes. So if you do not know what depth is at any given moment, and it is relatively volatile, meaning your expectations are likely to be incorrect, 
then you may end up trading at the wrong time. So you may end up trading when depth is uh, low, such as about lunchtime in financial markets. Right? As we discussed, trading is concentrated around market opening and closing hours, and during the day nobody actually does anything. So during the day would be a wrong time in this respect. So let us look at the effects uh, that this would have, that the depth uncertainty would have on the market. For this, we will consider a kind of reduced form Kyle model. So we will not model the dealers, the market makers in this model, but we will just assume that depth lambda is um, there. So the price satisfies a linear pricing rule with depth lambda, but traders are not exactly sure what this lambda is. Or uh, more correctly, in a transparent market, they would observe lambda. In an opaque market, they would not know what lambda exactly is. So let us look at how exactly this works. If you remember, in the Kyle model, the trader's problem was to maximize their expected profit. Uh, so what is it? Let me even say it max expectation of x their order size times gains from trade so this will be the true fundamental valuation v of the asset and they know v minus the price p and so this will be equal to once we plug in the linear pricing rule to uh, x times v minus uh, mu minus lambda times uh, v minus mu. No, no, of course not. Uh, lambda times the total order size, so lambda times x plus the order size of the uninformed traders u. Once we take the expectation u just vanishes because um, uninformed traders trade zero on average. So we'll just have this. And uh, yeah, we can remove the expectation at this point. And so the first order condition of this problem, again, taking the first derivative with respect to x will be v minus mu minus to lambda x equal to zero. So the optimal trade size will be v minus mu over two lambda. Now this was the case when lambda was known. What if lambda is not known? What will change in this problem? Well, at the expectation stage, Nothing really changes, but once we take the expectations, we will still not know lambda. Oops. So we'll have the expected lambda here, which means that in the um, in the optimal order size, the trade size of the informed trader will be inversely proportional to expectation, expected value of lambda. So, no. Yeah. So in the transparent market, the order size is proportional to 1 over lambda. In the opaque market, it's proportional to 1 over the expected value of lambda. And at this point, we can use something called Jensen's inequality, which says that um, let me write it. Inequality. If you have some function f of x and it is convex, then the ex talking and typing at the same time is still difficult. Then the expected value of f of x will be greater than f evaluated at the expected value of x. 
And if x is concave, the inequality goes in the other way around. I guess you should also add strictly convex. And what we can also observe is that 1 over x is a strictly convex function of x, meaning that this inequality will apply. So what we will have is exactly this. Expected value of 1 over lambda will be greater than 1 over expected value of lambda, which means that expected volume of trade in a transparent market would be greater than the volume of trade in, opaque in the opaque market. So volumes will be lower, probably the market will be slightly less liquid. On the upside, there will be less informed trading. So in general equilibrium, it will also have some effects on lambda. Uh, but in this reduced form analysis, uh, we can just say that the volume of trade will be lower. So let us probably in the remaining part of this first part of today's lecture look at why exactly this, this is true. What is the intuition behind it? Why will um, informed traders trade less when they are not certain about the depth of the market? Where does this risk aversion come from? So, we'll do it using a graph. So this will be our order size x for the informed traders, and we'll draw profits as a function of this x. So if price sensitivity is very high, let me try to see if I can draw it properly. Yeah. Our profits are a quadratic function of x, if you remember. So if you go here, our profit was just a downward facing parabola as a function of x. So it will look something like this. If lambda is high, I'll denote it by lambda h, and if lambda is low, we will have a parabola that looks something like this. So this is lambda L. So if you know that lambda L, you'll want to trade this much. This is the amount X that maximizes the profit when lambda is L. This is the uh, trading amount that maximizes profits when lambda is high. So what if, suppose that both of these lambdas happen with equal probabilities, and you do not know which of these lambdas uh, is actually the case, and you are trading some average amount uh, expected value of x. So this is x L, this is x H. So with 50% probability you will get this high of a profit, if lambda is actually L. With 50% probability you will get this level of profit, because lambda is H. And let us see, is this optimal? So what will be the effects of changing x from this level. If you decrease x a little bit, you will move along this red curve to the left. What you get is price sensitivity is really high, so you are trading some number of units, and it's really expensive for you. So the marginal effect of decreasing x by a little bit will be a lower price on slightly lower number of units. But this price effect will be stronger because lambda is high. 
then the price effect from decreasing x and lambda being low, in which case uh, you decrease the price a little bit, but since lambda is low, you decrease the price by not enough. So the price impact from lambda h is stronger than price impact in lambda l, which is just the definition of lambdas that we have. There are price impact coefficients. But the big idea is that you are more afraid of lambda being high than you are happy from lambda being low. So the effect of decreasing x from this average level will be stronger uh, if lambda is h than if lambda is l. So you, want, you will want to decrease x a little bit because you'll gain more in this red scenario than you will lose in the blue scenario. This is the intuition of the outline. Uh, outline of the intuition. So this is it. Um, yeah, let me give the intro to the next part and then we'll take a break. So we looked at two kinds of transparency. We have looked at uh, quotes being visible or invisible, readily accessible or, or not. And we also looked at depth being observable or not. Yet another kind of pre-trade transparency that you can think of, yet another kind of, yet another piece of information that you can get uh, before the trade, or I guess during the trade, is order flow transparency. So the idea here is that sometimes you do not get to see what current orders are. What are you trading against? And for example, in OTC markets, in foreign exchange markets, it might be the case that some large market order is executed against many different liquidity providers. So I want to buy a thousand units of a stock. I buy 200 from this dealer. I buy 300 from another dealer. I buy the rest from yet another dealer. And none of them really know what the total order flow is, what the big total order is. So the question is, should we make this information available to all the dealers? And what will the effects of that be? And we will look at that right after the break. So let's take five here and we'll be right back.